Welcome. In this podcast, we'll discuss standard operating protocols, often referred to as SOPs. By the end of the podcast, students should be able to explain what an SOP is, outline the major sections of an SOP, discuss where an SOP could be used and why it would be useful to use one, and identify some of the common flaws in SOPs. So let's get started. SOPs are written documents that outline step-by-step procedures for an experimental procedure critical to the integrity of a process. SOPs are used whenever it's important to assure the accuracy and precision of the results and the integrity of the process used. SOPs are primarily used in industry and government, but also in the academy. In industry, they are commonly employed in quality control and quality assurance units, in research and development, and in production. SOPs are used to document the proper procedures that have been followed to standardize training and in legal matters to establish the chain of custody. SOPs can be used to outline procedures for transportation and storage of raw materials, sampling procedures, lab protocols for important experimental procedures, Um, and as I stated earlier, they provide legal documentation when needed, clear procedures for the analysis of data and information on how to report. From my vantage point as an instructor, SOPs allow me to gain insight into your knowledge of the subject and your thinking, your problem-solving skills, your ability to communicate effectively in writing, and since we author the SOPs in teams, your team-building skills as well. So they're valuable in, in both the private sector, but also in the academy. On the next several slides, we'll walk our way through the general form for an SOP. The SOP should have a descriptive title that outlines its purpose. The SOP should be dated, and the date should include the year for legal purposes. SOPs are usually revised and updated on a regular basis, and when they're revised, the date and the revision number for the SOP should be prominently displayed at the top. The name of the author of the SOP should be listed. And beneath it, there should be a brief statement of the purpose for the SOP. The next major section is entitled Scope and Applicability. This section should detail the conditions under which the SOP can be used reliably to carry out the specific procedure. If a specific instrument is required, a specific model with specific capabilities, this information should be provided. Anything that uh, limits the scope of the procedure um, should be outlined in this particular section. And and so this could mean uh, identification of certain reagents, uh, glassware cleaning protocols, if plastic wear is required. Again, anything that's required to obtain the same quality of results as is outlined in the in the SOP should be detailed in the scope and applicability. Next, the SOP should have a brief introduction, and this section should inclu- introduce the problem that requires the use of an SOP, the methods that are going to be used, and the instrumentation. And any analytical instrumentation should uh, include the make and the model of the instrument. If you're using a separations-based scheme, then the specific column chemistry should be outlined. And if there are several different manufacturers and several different columns that could be used to obtain the specific quality of results, then those columns should be specifically identified here. All reagents, materials, equipment, any supplies that are required should be identified and listed. If you uh, need five 20 milliliter uh, volumetric flasks, then that specific information should be uh, listed here. If there are specific grades of of reagents that are required, 
then these should be identified here. If you need um, metal grade um, stock solutions, that should be uh, listed. If you are going to use esoteric reagents or equipment, then the SOP should name the manufacturer, the company, and provide full address information so that anyone uh, attempting to follow your SOP can uh, identify and obtain uh, the same uh, equipment or reagents. Cautions in terms of lab safety, safety should be provided uh, specifically if there are any dangerous solvents or reagents that are going to be required to execute the protocol. And information should be included as to how to handle any spills or other types of accidents that uh, might occur involving any dangerous reagents or materials. And lastly, in terms of safety, the SOP should indicate how to handle any waste that's generated as a result of using the SOP. The next section outlines the qualifications for any individuals executing the protocol. If there are peculiar training requirements, such as uh, experience with radioactivity, um, then these training requirements should be listed. If prior knowledge or experience with a specific analytical instruments required, then this information needs to be included. If, for example, you are going to be working with air sensitive reagents and uh, skill in uh, Schlenk line work was required, then that uh, training uh, or experience should be listed here as well. SOPs should be reviewed and revised regularly, as I stated at the outset, and when they're reviewed, the date of the revision and the revision number should be specified. The next section is the heart of the document, um, and that's the protocol itself. The protocol should detail everything from turning on the instrument, preparing the samples, through to analysis and interpretation of the analysis of any data obtained. Figures and tables are extremely helpful, and so are sample calculations. More is better when writing an SOP. Finally, there should be a succinct list of any relevant resources that um, you, would be particularly helpful that you've obtained from the peer-reviewed literature. If there is an article in the peer-reviewed literature on which you have based the SOP, then that reference should be included here. Next, I'd like to talk briefly about some of the common problems uh, that uh, are encountered in terms of uh, authoring and individuals who have to follow uh, authored pro uh, SOPs. Writing is critical in terms of uh, an, an SOP. Your writing needs to be crisp, it needs to be clear, um, attention to detail really counts here. You need to make sure that nothing is left to the imagination. Of course, as an SOP is a written document, it's very important to use proper grammar, spelling, and to proof your work. If you have a spelling, grammar, or typos in your work, then the implication is that your um, SOP might be of less quality um, and you don't want that to happen. Make sure that your SOP is not written with undefined acronyms. Keep your use of acronyms to a minimum as SOPs are often used as training documents. Judicious use of visuals, as I stated earlier, can be a real plus in an SOP. Remember though that each figure and table needs a caption that figures and tables must be called out in the text itself, and that figures and tables should be numbered sequentially based on the order they are referred to in the text. And this slide shows an example of what not to do, and I've taken a figure from a published paper. The reference is provided for you at the bottom of, uh, of the page. At the top, you'll see the uh, figure number and the figure caption. Figure caption itself is, is uh, certainly fine. It's very detailed, tells you how many replicate uh, analyses were performed uh, for each of the samples, tells you specific, specific conditions that were used to obtain the quality of results. However, if you look at the figure on the face of it, 
there's just simply too much data. And there tends to be a tendency for people when they're putting together papers or SOPs to provide too much information. Keep your SOP simple. An SOP should be authored for one single pr procedure producing one specific result. So your figure should not uh, uh, should not be anything like uh, the figure that's shown on this page. And I want to make one last comment. I pulled this figure from an article because it's a, an example of a very poor article uh, that would appear in a technical journal such as analytical chemistry. Um, the tendency for most individuals when they've conducted a very thorough study is to essentially um, regurgitate all of their results um, and want to sh overshare them uh, with the reader of the article. And that really is um, a, a, a serious flaw because it doesn't uh, produce the desired result and that is communication of uh, the key findings to the reader. Um, a representative sample of what the authors have accomplished in this specific case uh, would have been a far a more effective uh, use of very limited graphical space. Bad. Next, a uh, common problem, and this is probably the most common problem, is when you write an SOP, it's really important to test it and make sure it works. And the common flaw is that the person who authors the SOP attempts to test their protocol by themselves. And the problem with that is that you already know what it is that you want to do. You know how it's supposed to come out. And so you're sort of inserting yourself into the written document and you're filling the gaps that may exist. So it's never a good idea to evaluate your own work it's always better to ask someone who has a similar technical background but no, um, no uh, first-hand experience in the specific process uh, for which you're authoring the SOP to actually test it and carry it out. Make sure your protocol includes information on how to measure success. This is another common flaw. If the SOP is intended to be used to identify an analyte, then what specific characteristics can be used to identify the analyte? Specify those in writing in the SOP and be sure to use appropriate measurement statistics so that your reader can evaluate what success is. And this might mean uh, specifying the number of replicate measurements that were, should be used in the intended data set uh, what the mean value uh, is, and the standard deviation. Be specific, be precise. And uh, I'd say those really represent the major problems with SOPs. And so that's basically going to bring this short podcast to a close. At this point, I'd encourage you to take a moment and review the learning objectives. At this point, can you now explain the purpose of an SOP? Can you outline the major sections for an SOP? Can you uh, discuss where an SOP might be useful and explain why? And lastly, what are some of the common flaws in SOPs? Thank you, and I wish you the best on uh, writing your own effective SOPs.